Thank you very much. Thank you. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's exciting event on the future of public health, What's Next? We're very fortunate to have a wonderful panel group today that are going to lead us in our discussions, and I'd like to thank them for their effort and, and for coming here. So uh, Yumichi uh, Alcindor, uh, Sonia uh, Shah, uh, our, our uh, uh, moderator, Laurie, uh, uh, Julie uh, Rodner, and then uh, and lastly, uh, Laura Sullivan. Laura. So, uh, you know, our school is the first independent graduate school of public health, and we've spent the last uh, year celebrating our centennial. Our actual birthday is Monday. That'll be the day uh, that we'll celebrate uh, the occasion of the, of the Rockefeller Foundation announcing the gift that created our school. And so we've concentrated somewhat on the heritage and the history and our accomplishments in research and education and, and global health. But we know that really what this celebration should be about is thinking about the future. And that's what today's event is about. We brought together leading journalists and authors to talk to us today. So you might ask, because they asked us at lunch, why did you invite us here? And what we said is, well, we talk to academics all the time, and we talk about research, but we know that you all have an incredible influence on the American public through your ability to communicate, to understand the science, and communicate it. And that's why we asked you to be here, because we want to learn from you today. You play a critical role in shaping public opinion about issues related to public health. And you do that, as I said, because you have a deep knowledge of the topics, but you know how to communicate. So I'm looking forward to a, to a great discussion that I know will be informed by the very best minds. And now I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Julie Robner. She's the Robin Toner Distinguished Fellow at Kaiser Health News. She is one of the country's leading journalists. She worked for NPR for 16 years as a health policy correspondent. She's a recognized expert on health policy issues and is the author of a critically praised reference book, Healthcare Policy and Politics, A to Z. She is the recipient of the National Press Foundation's Everett McKinley Dirksen Award for Distinguished Reporting for Congress for her coverage of the passage of the Medicare prescription drug law and its aftermath. Please join me in welcoming Julie Robner. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dean Clagg. It is truly an honor for me to be here for one of the school's signature centennial events. Uh, as you mentioned, the three writers that we're about to hear from are not scientists, but they know what they write. They bring expertise to their topics and are intimately familiar with the challenges of public health. That's especially important because their work, which is primarily directed to a lay audience, helps to shape broad opinions and attitudes to critical public health issues. They help the public understand that public health is not some esoteric specialty that takes place in places like this, but it's what we eat and drink, where we live, and how we interact with those around us. Today our focus is on pandemics, social justice, and mental health, all issues that will no doubt have significant implications for the future of public health. As we've seen recently with influenza and now the Zika virus, responding to and controlling the modern pandemic presents massive public health challenges Population growth, globalization, and increasing human interaction all raise the stakes in terms of the human toll and financial losses. Social justice is inextricably tied to the health of individuals and communities. We see it in Flint, Michigan's water crisis, and here in Baltimore, where decades of entrenched discriminatory policies have led to extreme health disparities. In just one shocking example, life expectancies in some urban Baltimore communities are 20 years shorter than neighborhoods just five miles away. Despite federal laws intending to establish parity, mental health care is too often substandard inaccessible, underfunded, and for too many, non-existent. One consequence of these systemic weaknesses is that the nation's jails and prisons have become, by default, makeshift mental asylums where patients are too often incarcerated without treatment. Still, some jails have developed promising programs for mentally ill prisoners that may serve as models. Our speakers today will dive deep into these issues based on their own research and will provide some glimpses of the future and what we might expect. So here's our plan for today. Each of our speakers will give a presentation of 20 minutes or so and then will sit down with me for a bit of conversation. If you'd like to tweet, 
about what we're talking about, and please do. Please use the hashtag Future of Public Health. So let's get to it. Our first speaker is Yumisha Alcindor. She's a national political reporter at the New York Times. She's covered the presidential campaign of Senator Bernie Sanders and has written stories about the last year of President Obama's presidency and the political concerns of Haitian Americans. As a national multimedia journalist at USA Today, she's covered breaking news and social justice issues. She also writes and produces videos about societal concerns, including human trafficking and gun violence and poverty. Yamish, the floor is yours. Um, first, I'd like to just say thank you to the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health for inviting me here today. I'm really excited. Um, Bernie Sanders was meeting with President Obama today, but I was lucky enough to still be able to join you, so thank you um, for that. Um, and I'm going to be looking at my phone a little bit because I should say that I not only create news off of my phone, I get news off of my phone, and I kind of am very connected to my phone. So I hope that you guys, I know that, that, that the phones are going to be on silent, but I hope that you'll be tweeting and will welcome me as I look at my phone sometimes. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do when I, when I got asked to do this talk, I started thinking how am I going to explain kind of how, what I've covered and I thought that the best way to do that was to really just kind of talk about the arc of my career and in that way it will I think explain the arc of the challenges um, that we're facing as Americans. So the first thing I wanted to do was just tell you a little bit about where I started. Um, like many journalists, I started covering news in my hometown. Um, my first ever kind of byline was in the West Side Gazette. It was a small African-American newspaper in South Florida. Um, and at that time, I was 17 years old. And the questions that I, were at, that I was asking were related to social justice, but I had no idea what social justice meant. At 17, I had never heard the phrase before. I had never really even thought of segregation. I'd never really thought of all the things that were going on in my neighborhood. But I knew that I had these questions. And my questions, I thought, were going to be simple questions. They were going to be, why was I the only, one of the only black kids in my AP chemistry class when the majority of my high school was African American students? My questions were, why do I have to get bused from the suburbs to go, to a, for, to go into urban cities to, to attend a pre-magnet pregnant school? Um, why do I have to, why, why does my mom go out every morning as a, public school te as a public school social worker and talk to people in these communities that look completely different than where I live? These were simple questions, I thought, as a 17-year-old. I've now realized that I've spent the better part of my career trying to answer those questions. Um, and that kind of brought me to one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today, which is segregation. Um, if you look at a map of the United States, you can quickly find out that people live in, and people of different races live in completely different spaces. Um, you can look at the, at the key yourself and see that the, they're representing African American residents, white residents, Asian American residents, Hispanic residents. So if you look at that map, just think about where you live or where your family lives. Think about kind of where the biggest stories of our country have been. And when I think about it and I look at that map, I thought, wow, this is what our country is. This is our country, as much as we say that segregation is about the 1960s and that term is about the 1960s, what we're really knowing, what we really know is that all you have to do is ask people where they live and you know that segregation is alive and well right now. Um, I have a coworker named Nicole Hannah, Hannah Jones um, who writes extensively about segregation in schools. She did a really fantastic piece um, looking at Michael Brown's high school and how angry people were when that school started to be integrated. And while that school was, you don't consider it being integrated in that word, you think, oh, we're not integrating schools anymore, it's not the 1960s. These parents were very upset with how this school was being integrated. Um, and the, to me, it made me think I want to look at this map. And all you have to do is look at other cities. I wanted to pick out some cities that you'd be familiar with. So New York, Baltimore, Chicago, to me, these are the cities where I've kind of made my career, and these are the cities that have that I've ended up parachuting in for protests, for murders, for just, or in my own case, I live in a pretty segregated neighborhood in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, of course, as you know, is very much changing, but when I get off the train, 90% of the people in my neighborhood are African American. And I had to think about that for my own life. I thought, how did I end up here? I didn't grow up in, in a segregated community. I grew up in a pretty mixed community. 
But in Brooklyn, it came down to where, how could I afford rent and where were the buildings that I was looking at and I ended up in a segregated neighborhood. And that to me kind of explained to me kind of or made me think of this is how segregation happens. You don't really think I don't want to live around different people, but you look up and you're living around people who look like yourself. Um, and I think that that's really important. The other thing I want to talk about is kind of when I was asking these questions, um, I was thinking about how do I make segregation relevant to you, um, public health officials. I was thinking I'm at the public health school. I need to somehow become a scientist in the next 10, 10 seconds and figure this out. So all I had to do was Google segregation in healthcare, and I quickly realized which, what I'm sure all of you know, which is that I looked at some, some interesting things. African Americans are more likely to go to African American doctors. African American doctors are more, are more likely to have patients who are in fair or poor health. They're more likely to have patients that are obese. They're more likely to have patients that use the ER as their primary source of health care. And I thought to myself, there goes segregation right there. It's looking at us in our face. It's looking at us when we go to the doctor's office. And to me, that, that, that was kind of what I wanted to talk about. And then when I started thinking about it, I thought, well, I've never covered like segregation in medical healthcare, right? All I had to do was go back to one of my first internships in 2009 at the Washington Post. I was eager to tell a story. I really wanted to figure out you know, how to impress my editors. And I started thinking about kind of why I wanted to be a journalist. The reason why I became a journalist was because I was asking, again, those burning questions that I had. And when I thought about it, I went back to this woman who her name was, her, her name was Mrs. Boone. And she, at 55 years old, had been going to the emergency room for her primary source of health care for two decades. So I interview her, and I interviewed her in 2009. And for, since 1989, she had been going to the ER for her primary source of health care. She, she needed knee surgery. She had asthma. She had all these different ailments that she needed. And guess where she lived? She lived in Anacostia, Washington, DC obviously a predominantly black neighborhood. And I thought, there goes segregation and there goes public health creeping into my own career without me ever really even thinking about it. I started thinking a little bit more and my next gig, my first full-time gig was at Newsday in Long Island. So I'm about 22 years old looking for stories and there is, as you know, a lot, of, a lot of young reporters, they start out kind of covering crime, they start out kind of covering breaking news. So one day I got sent to this murder. This guy had killed a woman and a man and killed himself. Simple story, you could write it up. Not simple at all. I started digging. He had killed his best friend and his best friend's girlfriend and he had just been released from prison. He had been on mental health care. He had had mental health care in prison. He had had medication in prison. And then he gets out of prison and he's dropped into this predominantly black neighborhood in Long Island with no background, with no help, with no one to really kind of walk him through the system, he ends up falling kind of through the cracks, I would say. And while of course he has his own responsibility for why he did what he did, when I started interviewing people and talking to people, even the own victim's family, because again, he killed his best friend, they said, you know, he really had a lot of problems that were not really looked at. And I think that I thought, again, there goes mental health, there goes public health creeping back up into my life, creeping back up into my reporting. Next gig, one of my, I, I think, the gig that really, I think, made me know what I wanted to do and made me know that I wanted to dedicate my life to kind of social justice issues um, and social justice reporting was I joined the staff of the USA Today in 2011. In 2011, um, I was kind of dropped into all these different national stories of a mass shooting happened or something happened, I would be dropped into these places. And I thought, okay, I can do this. I was trying to get my career together, trying to understand how this goes. You're quickly taking things in. And then I ended up bumping into this girl, or I ended up interviewing this woman who, her name was Asia Graves. Um, I still talk to her to this day. She had been human trafficked um, and was a human trafficking victim, a sex, a sex trafficking victim. And she was only 16 um, when a man bought her on the street and, and paid $200 to have sex with her. And I thought to myself, this is what I was looking at. This is kind of the issues that I'm seeing. But here's a whole new form of this that I didn't really know existed. Part of the reason why I ended up talking to her was because I was doing this story about human trafficking, but I was realizing that human trafficking victims can be in public schools. And that, to me, was so counterintuitive. Why would you have a, a human trafficking victim in a public school? She was recruiting other girls 
from her high school to be human trafficked. And I thought to myself, this is ridiculous. This, is, this, is, this shouldn't happen. Um, and to me, I guess, I, I say all that to say that there are all these different forms of trauma that are going on um, in these different neighborhoods. Um, and that's kind of what takes me to Ferguson, which I think was really a, a, a seminal moment in our country's history. So I'm gonna play some videos from you that I shot in Ferguson while reporting there, um, just so you can look at them and know what I was doing. So I show you that um, because I think now, with some distance between that, I didn't realize what I was in the middle of. That was all shot by me. Those are people looting in a store, and I decided against all thinking to just go in and start documenting human history. Um, and I went in there and I documented that. And I think Ferguson to me showed me kind of the culmination of all the things I'd been writing about. I'd been writing about segregation. I'd been writing about people struggling with the system. I'd been writing about the criminal justice system. And then here comes Ferguson kind of bursting into the seams of our country. Um, and a lot of people were really, I guess, surprised by Ferguson. I think we were all in some ways surprised. I think even Ferguson residents might be surprised by the form that it took. But no one that I talked to, a lot of the people that I talked to, I should say, we're not surprised that this would happen. It was not surprised that this powder keg existed. Um, people on the street knew what the DOJ found out later, which was that even though Ferguson was only 67% black, the majority of the people being arrested, the majority of the people being stopped by the police, the majority of the people having use of force used against them, they were all African American. And that to me is what Ferguson became. It became this thing that reminded us that our country has a lot more to do. Our country has so much more to go. And I think that as a journalist, I remember just like writing about this and trying to do my best working on two hours of sleep and knowing that I had a responsibility to my country um, that I didn't really understand before. Um, and I know that, I guess, the press is obviously, is obviously included in the, in the Constitution, but I think for the first time in my life, I realized that like this is why we're in the Constitution. We're in the Constitution because I can stand here and I can get tear gassed and you can't make me move. And I think that for the first time in my life, I realized like I also am very much important as a black journalist because I can tell this story because I was a little girl who was asking questions about my high school that was like Michael Brown's only but a couple years ago. Um, so to me, it, it was a full circle moment. So even though I'm talking about my career, I'm also talking about, to me, you start seeing these things as a 17 year old and then you realize that these things are so systemic, that Ferguson's are all over the place. The Chicago Police Department just came out with a report talking about discrimination in their police department. Some news organizations didn't even run with it at the top of their, at the top of their stories or didn't run with it at all because it was like, oh, we already know that. But think about that for a minute. We already know that police departments are gonna be discriminating against African Americans or people of color. And some of our news organizations won't put that at the top of their stories, won't put that at the top of their, their, their newscasts, won't put that on their front pages. That to me means something. And that to me is kind of where I go to my responsibility as a journalist. And kind of I also think about like what Black Lives Matters taught me. I think. Black Lives Matters obviously was what, what came bursting out of Ferguson um, and what became bursting out of all these things. Um, I won't bore you, I won't tell you about all the things I, I've also covered, like the trial of George Zimmerman, but all these things kind of culminated into Black Lives Matter. And I think Black Lives Matter is not just this organization, I know some people describe it as like an organization with chapters all over the country, and there is that. But Black Lives Matter is also like a request by activists to really be seen and to really look at our segregated communities and say, this black neighborhood that we know is a black neighborhood, that we don't have to dance around and act like it's not a black neighborhood, that this black neighborhood should matter as much as any other neighborhood in this, in this country. But it doesn't right now. And I think I, as a journalist, should not dance around that idea and should really have the confidence and the courage 
to really write that and say the word racism if it, if it is racism. Um, and I think sometimes as an African-American journalist, people are, are, are nervous or people don't want to say that that is racism. And I think that Ferguson and um, reading people like ta Coates just reminded me that I have to call it like it is. I have to say when something isn't right. I have to say if, this, if, I'm, if I'm seeing things and people on the street are telling me, I'm throwing this rock at this police officer because even though I know I might get arrested, it, even though I know that this doesn't, isn't going to change anything tomorrow, it makes me feel good and that that's a story in itself. Um, so while I was writing about Ferguson, one of the things that was interesting to me was, you know, people were writing about looters and they were writing about all these terrible things that were happening in Ferguson. And I ended up writing this story um, about the fact that when I was in Ferguson, the looters were asking me if I needed, if I could get to my car safely. And the, the scary police officers, you know, the, the police officers that at this point we now have been called, we're, this militarized police um, department was also saying, do you need a ride home? And some of these young guys that were carrying out, you know, bottles of liquor and were looking really scary on TV, they were hitting on me and asking me for my number. <laughs> And I had to think that these, this is, this is humanity, right? This is not, oh, okay, we can just write, we can say that it's, they are rioters, and then that means that we divorce ourselves from understanding that they're human beings. Um, and I think that that's what Ferguson taught me. So I think that that was kind of, I guess, my career. And I guess the other thing I want to say is, um, I guess, what, what should we do now? I, I, I was looking at the email for what we should talk about, and it said, what should people do? As a reporter, to me, it's, I think people should acknowledge this, and I think people should talk about this. I think that it's important to not just know that this is out there, but to really think about it, to really say, what, 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 is, what am I doing about this? What is my role in this? How is this affecting me? How do I see this? I'm not saying for you to become an activist. I'm a journalist. I'm not an activist. I think sometimes people confuse that because they think, oh, she sounds like she's advocating. And really, I want to advocate for facts, right? So facts are that the DOJ has found that the Ferguson Police Department was biased. Those aren't, as a journalist, me making that up. There's a whole report that you can read about that. Those are facts. Facts are that there are African American, that there are less African American journalists than there are white, white journalists. That's just a fact. So to me, um, when I think about my career, I think about the fact that I just want to point out facts that remind us that this country has a long way to go. Um, and I guess I think about, I'm a member of the National Association of Black Journalists. Um, it's given me a lot of my mentors. It's given me people like Tremaine Lee, Nicole Hannah-Jones, Sarah Hoy. Um, it's given me friends like Wesley Lowry, who was arrested in Ferguson. It's given me all these people that's created this community. And I don't have to feel bad about the fact that I say I, I belong to an organization for black journalists. For me, that's OK. And I think that it, sometimes people can say, oh, well, why would you want to do that? But I know that diversity in journalism is important. And I know that this organization's mission to make, uh, make media organizations diverse is also important. Um, so that's what I have to say about that. Um, and then I wanted to show you really quickly some clips, um, because I'm running out of time, so I want to show you really quickly some clips of Black Lives Matter protesters um, really kind of pointedly asking some questions of the presidential candidates, two of the presidential candidates that are running right now.
and Trump mm -hmm. have been in no uncertain way partially responsible for it's more than most. I'm gonna ask if you can stop it right there because I'm running out of time. Um, but I just wanted to say that I'm covering this presidential election now, but I'm still that 17-year-old girl trying to answer those questions. Um, and I think that these activists are also trying to answer some questions. And I think that no matter who becomes president, I think that we're gonna have these questions that are gonna continue to inform what's next. So I think what's next is we're gonna confront this. We're gonna ask ourselves if we like the country that we live in, if we're okay with the segregation, if we're okay with biased police departments, and if we're okay with, and if we're okay with just the way things are. Um, and as a journalist, I'm gonna keep hopefully writing and asking very tough questions um, in any way I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was inspiring. Um, you've done, as, as you said, an awful lot of things uh, in, in your so far very brief career. Is there a single issue or image from your reporting on social justice that kind of continues to haunt you? Mm -hmm. I think the image that probably continues to haunt me, um, I was the only reporter who saw Michael Brown in his casket. Um, and I think that that to me haunts me in some ways, um, apart from the case, apart from obviously Darren Wilson was cleared. Obviously a grand jury decided not to indict him. So I'm not saying he's guilty. I'm not saying that he should be punished or charged, but I'm saying that there was somebody there who was in that casket, who, I, who looked like my brother, who looked like people that I'd covered, um, and whose family looked like any family of any race when they were crying. And I think that that definitely sticks with me. That definitely is something that when I'm 80 years old, I'm gonna still be able to, to picture him and be able to, to think about that and to be able to wonder what I'm doing about that. How can the world of public health best address issues of social justice that engender the health disparities that you talked about? I mean, I think part of it is one, recognizing it and then really kind of assessing what your role is in that um, and really trying to figure out if you are interested in, in, in those issues and if you are, if you're a doctor, if you're, if you're someone who's, who's teaching people, are you recruiting more diverse doctors? Are you seeking out communities and, and wondering whether or not these communities have the medical needs that they need? I mean, obviously Johns Hopkins is in the middle of Baltimore. I'm sure that you do a lot with the city around you. So I think it's really just being aware and, and really wondering kind of on a very personal level. Like for me, journalism was what I wanted to do. I didn't want to be an activist or a doctor or as my parents wanted me to be a lawyer. Um, I wanted to be a journalist, so I knew that I wanted to really be an observer and be a kind of a professional witness. Um, and that, so that's, I think, how I personally answered some of those questions, but I think that that's kind of what you have to do. You have to really look at what you want to do. Do you think there need to be more studies? I mean, you were saying, you know, one of the issues with the Chicago police force was that, well, everybody already knew that they were biased. So why was it news when you had a study that said that they were biased? Is that some of the concern about some of the health issues that go with this? It's like, you know, wow, there's big disparities between African Americans who, you know, live in inner cities, even though they're, you know, in the shadows of, of healthcare that they don't get it. How do, you, how do you get over that problem of you know, things that people already know versus things that you then go out and academically demonstrate again and again? I think it's really trying to figure out how do we know what we know? So everyone in Ferguson knew that the police department stopped African Americans more, but how do we really, like how as a government do we know that? Um, I once read about, a, like I said, a colleague of mine, Wesley Lowry, who said, that you know, the police department killing somebody is really the government killing somebody. Like, let's not make, it's not an individual officer who's doing anything. We're saying that our government can be biased and that that's not news. And I think that if, I think, so I think it's really pushing those boundaries, but really asking how do we know what we know. So the Washington Post won a Pulitzer for documenting people who were killed by the police. But you think about it, like the newspaper was doing that, not our government. And I think that the, those questions, we were all, I think, baffled when Ferguson happened. And I said, I called you know, our research department, well, okay, can you give me the stats on how many people are killed by police? There were none. And I think that was the first time that me as a reporter thought, wait, what? <laughs> there are no stats? How is that possible? So I think that asking those kind of questions, and I'm not sure if there are stats for how many black doctors there are, how many, you know, how many, what the healthcare disparities are, but I'm sure that there are things that you know that aren't, haven't been studied. 
Is there one single issue that, or piece of this that people, that the public at large, doesn't understand about social justice and how it relates to public health? Mm, I think the only the thing I can think about is, I guess, how it affects people on a daily basis. Um, so when I was an intern at the Washington Post, I wrote that story about that that lady who um, this this woman, Miss Booth, who who had been going to the ER since 1989, and I think that really like finding people and really thinking about like personal people's lives, um, I think is something that's kind of lost. I think when you say, oh, you know, people go to the ER, if I, I had to go find this lady, I had to go put in the work to go find someone who actually was doing this and then write about her and then think, are we okay with her life? Um, so I think that there, there's some of that is missing. I think sometimes it's easy to say like, oh, okay, well, we know that prejudice exists. We live in America. We know how it was founded. We know our original sin. So you know, we know that that's gonna be there, but I think really wondering and asking, okay, but like, is that okay? And like, what, and, and is that, how is that affecting everybody's life on a very daily basis? Like not just thinking like on a, on a very high 10,000 feet level, but really thinking on an everyday person level. This is, as you mentioned, hardly a new issue. Um, you know, people are aware that, that, that segregation exists, that there are problems with social, social justice. What makes it so difficult? And, and even as a journalist, I mean, you're fighting that, oh, that's not a story because we all know that. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's tough. I think it's, it's, it's super tough um, to figure out how to make it news, to figure out, I mean, obviously Ferguson was such a big deal. Um, and I think activists say, like, you, like, you know, the, the, they, some of the activists I've talked to push back on this idea that if we hadn't made this amount, if there hadn't been this much uprising, it would have just been like, okay, well, we'll be there for a week and leave. And I think that that they might have, they might be right. They might, they, that we're not, I'm not sure if we would have covered Ferguson in the same way had there not been ongoing protests, hundreds of days of protests, um, of peaceful protests, most of them. But I think if we hadn't had those long, peaceful protests, we might have let the story go. So I think some of it is just, how, I guess in some ways, being forced to, to, to recognize this. And social media obviously plays a huge role in that. Um, I hear back from people about my stories instantly. Um, and I have to, and I, as a, as a reporter, I, I try to, I, I like to respond to people. I like to think like, yes, I'm a real person. <laughs> like, and, and I think that that, I think in some ways, um, keeps us all accountable. So one of, the, one of the things that I guess keeps us in the, in the media right now is that it has, as you've demonstrated, sort of become an issue in the presidential campaign, at least on the Democratic side. Um, is, that, is that good or bad for pursuing social justice? I mean, is the, is the best road through the political system or through academics or through some combination? As a reporter, I'll, I, I don't know if I can answer that as a reporter because I think activists themselves have to figure that out. Again, I mean, I know it's, some people like will, 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 will listen to this and think, oh my God, she's an activist. She's part of the Black Lives Matter movement. And it's like, no, I'm a writer that writes about the Black Lives Matter movement, just like someone might write about politics or write about the environment but not be an environmental activist. Um, but I think that that's really the activists that have to understand that and have to do that. And of course, right here in Baltimore, um, Dre McKesson was running for mayor. So I think his, he saw pol politics as important. I know other people who say they don't care about voting because that's not how they see this. They see this, they see their change coming through grassroots movements. They point to stuff like LGBTQ rights and they say that like that didn't happen because the Supreme Court got up one day and said, oh, I, we really think these people need rights. It happened because people organized in their communities and said, we are people, we've existed in this country for decades and now we want rights. So I think that it's gonna be, and so I think it's really up to them, but I think that they're probably, and I see that there are people doing all kind of, taking all kinds of avenues of that. Do you think, you know, you used some, some of those amazing data visualizations. Do you think that the sort of the use of, of data is really helping this? I mean, helping demonstrate it in a concrete way to people who may have, as you said, known it all along, but never really got the magnitude of it? I think data definitely helps um, because as a reporter, I, when I can look at something, when I can look at numbers, not just anecdotally, and while I like to write about people and, and like to have kind of individual stories, it's really, to me, sweeping. It's when you can say, this is, these are the hard facts. Um, so I think that that data is important, which is kind of going back to that public health question and what do you do? It's how do you research this? How do we come out with papers? And like, it's tedious work. I'm a journalist, so I don't, <laughs> that's not the work that I do. Um, but I think that being able to have those numbers are, is incredibly important. 
Good. Well, thank you for all your work. Um, we're going to turn to our next speaker now, who is. Oh, Our next speaker is Sonia Shaw. Sonia is a prize-winning science writer and investigative journalist who's written critically acclaimed books on malaria, human rights, the drug industry, and international politics. Her fourth and most recent book is Pandemic, Tracking Contagions from Cholera to Ebola and Beyond. It was selected as a New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice. A recent article in the New York Review of Books described Shaw's book as, quote, required reading for anyone working in global health. So with that, Sonia, please take the stage. So in 1962, Sir McFarlane Burnett, the virologist, said that to write about infectious diseases was as if to write about something that had passed into history. Then over the following 50 years, over 300 infectious pathogens either newly emerged or re-emerged into new places where they'd never been seen before. So Zika is just really the latest one. We've had Ebola in West Africa, where it had never been seen before, new kinds of avian influenza, um, including one that struck the United States, caused the biggest outbreak of animal disease in US history last year, um, new kinds of coronaviruses like SARS and MERS, um, tick-borne illnesses, uh, antibiotic-resistant bacterial pathogens, and the list goes on and on. So as a writer interested in social change, and as a science journalist, this really interested me. So I spent the, fall, the last six years trying to figure out how it is that microbes turn into um, these pandemic-causing pathogens. And I did that to, through a, a number of different ways. I looked at the history of pandemics. This is uh, cholera in 1832 in New York City from a data visualization we did with Pulitzer Center on crisis reporting. Um, so I looked at the history of pandemics, um, and I focused particularly on cholera because it's one of our most successful pandemic-causing pathogens. It's caused seven pandemics in its history, and it's extremely deadly. It kills about half the people who get it if they're not promptly treated. Um, and it's going on right now, just a few hundred miles off the coast of Florida and Haiti, which is pictured here. Um, then I also went to places where new pathogens are emerging to try to figure out what are the political and social drivers that push these microbes into human populations. And I found that certainly the major source is, of course, wildlife. Um, about 60% of the new pathogens that are emerging today come out of animals. Over 70% of those come out of wild animals. So from bats, we've gotten Ebola and Nipah and SARS and Marburg. From birds, we've gotten avian influenza and West Nile virus. From rodents, we're getting monkeypox and Lyme disease. Um, for monkeys, of course, we've got malaria and HIV, also probably Zika. And it's, I think it's because as our human populations are expanding so much, we're destroying a lot of wildlife habitat. And of course, that means we lose a lot of species, wild species. But it also means that the ones that remain have to crowd in ever closer with human habitations. So we're creating more and more of these interfaces between humans and wildlife. And that allows for novel, intimate kinds of contact in which the microbes that live in their bodies can spill over into our bodies. But of course, just because these pathogens are emerging in people doesn't mean they're going to cause epidemics and pandemics. I mean, microbes, when you think about it, they're these microscopic little things with no independent locomotion whatsoever. Um, to spread, we have to provide those opportunities. It's human behaviors, of course. So we're providing those in a, in a huge amount through our cities. So the process of urbanization that first started in the 19th century, which cholera took advantage of, is really reaching its peak now. So by 2030, the majority of people will live in cities. And they're not going to be cities like Washington, D.C. and London. They're going to be cities more like Monrovia and Freetown in West Africa, where there's a lot of ad hoc development, a lot of uh, lack of infrastructure, and a lot of slums. About two billion of us will be living in slums by 2030. And we see some of these new pathogens are already starting to exploit these opportunities. Ebola is a great example where we had, you know, we've had Ebola outbreaks since at least the 1970s. But they were small and self-limited because uh, Ebola had never really reached any place that had more than a few hundred thousand inhabitants. 
Well, at the end of 2013, when Ebola broke out in West Africa, within a few weeks, it reached three capital cities with a combined population of nearly three million. And that's an important reason why it became such a huge conflagration, bigger than all the previous Ebola epidemics combined. And Zika, arguably, is also taking advantage of the rapid urban expansion in the tropi tropical Americas. You know, we've had Zika since at least the 1940s, but it was in equatorial Africa and Asia, carried by a forest mosquito, didn't really bite people that much. Well, now it's in Brazil and elsewhere in the Americas where there's been giant expansion of cities and with it the mosquitoes that bite humans and only humans, and that's a huge reason why it's been amplified the way it has. But it's not just uh, people that are crowding together so much these days, it's also our animals. We have more animals under domestication today than in the last 10,000 years of domestication until 1960 combined. So it's a huge number of animals we're keeping now to satisfy our demand for meat. And an increasing proportion of these animals live in really what you'd call the animal equivalent of a slum. That is factory farms, where you have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of individuals crowded really closely together where they're breathing on each other, they're touching each other, they're being exposed to each other's waste. And this is another opportunity that these new pathogens are exploiting. Avian influenza is a perfect example of that, um, where avian influenza normally lives in wild waterfowl, doesn't really cause a lot of disease in those birds. But because we're building these factory farms under the migratory pathways of these birds, particularly in Asia, those viruses get to drop down into these giant uh, places full of captive birds, and that means they get to replicate and amplify and mutate, and they become more virulent. So we've had an increasing frequency of these new kinds of more virulent forms of avian influenza as a result. Now, crowding, of course, leads to a secondary effect, which is sanitary crises. We still have our old sanitary crisis from, you know, the 19th century and beyond, about 2.6 billion people around the world don't have access to any modern sanitation, which is really a standing catastrophe that pathogens have been long taking advantage of. But we also have a new kind of sanitary crisis with our livestock waste. Around the world, our livestock produce 7 billion tons of excreta every year. And that's far more than croplands can possibly absorb, which is how we generally try to use these wastes and have in the past. So what we have now is a lot of these manure lagoons. These are essentially giant open cesspools of animal waste, untreated. And so when it rains or when there's storms, all this material gets to get into the environment. And because so many people are exposed to uh, this waste material now, um, pathogens are taking advantage of this too. Shiga toxin producing E. coli is just one example. Um, this is a a pathogen that lives in about one half of all cattle on American feedlots. It doesn't really cause them any problems, but because their cattle waste is getting into our food and water so often, 70,000 Americans are getting sick with Shiga toxin producing E. coli every year. And then, of course, we're spreading this stuff around in the most efficient way possible with our flight network. Collar took advantage of canals and steam engines, but today we have something even better, which is not just a few capital cities with flights between them, but you know, airports in every small city and town, tens of thousands and not hundreds of thousands of connections between them. So even when one of these pathogens emerges in a place where there's, there's not a lot of susceptible populations, it can quickly travel to a place where there are susceptible populations, to such an extent, actually, that you can now predict um, where a pathogen will strike next simply by measuring the number of direct flights between infected and uninfected cities. So this map shows the same simulated flu pandemic that I showed you on the previous map. But this map is all the cities as connected by direct flights. And you can see on a map like this, a flu pandemic resolves into this sort of perfect series of waves. So these are some of the factors I looked at to try to understand how microbes become pandemic-causing pathogens, but it's really only half the story because, of course, we don't take this stuff lying down. We fight back. We have political defenses, medical defenses, um, social defenses. And so the other half of the story that I looked at is what are our constraints on 
meeting those challenges. So why, how are these pathogens able to get through our defenses? And I think one of the most important challenges is certainly the rise of private interests. Of the 100 biggest economies in the world today, only 49 are governments. 51 are corporations. So that means we have private interests that are far more powerful than some of our, even our governments and our public agencies. And you can see how that can allow pathogens to spread. Um, one example is with the World Health Organization, our premier public health institution, which now controls only 25% of its own budget. 75% is controlled by donors. And that has a real effect on how pathogens can spread. And Ebol the Ebola epidemic is just the most recent example. When the WHO delayed calling a public health emergency of international concern and mobilizing the international community by weeks and even months. And there's a number of reasons why. But we know one reason, according to leaked emails that were acquired by the Associated Press, is that they didn't want to frighten investors. But this isn't happening just in faraway places with weak states. This is happening right here in the United States as well. You look at antibiotic resistant bacteria, for example. Of course, we've all known since at least the 1940s that if you use antibiotics in a way that's not medically necessary, you will trigger the evolution of antibiotic resistance pa pathogens. Well, here in the United States today, 80% of the antibiotics we consume are used for commercial reasons. They're used by farmers in their livestock to enhance growth, to fatten their animals for market faster. And public health agencies like the FDA and others have tried to control this practice since at least the 1970s, and they've been stymied every step of the way by the farm lobby. As a result, we have 23,000 Americans dying of antibiotic-resistant pathogens every year. Now, medicine has come a long way since the time of cholera in 19th century, when, when, people, when doctors thought that cholera was spread by miasmas, these smelly airs, and wouldn't recognize that it was actually in the water. But at the same time, I do think that there is a mismatch. So we see a lot of these pathogens right now are coming out of animals, they're being driven through human populations through social and political factors. So you would think that the best way to kind of tackle this problem was through an interdisciplinary approach. Get the veterinarians and the wildlife biologists and the ecologists and the engineers and the anthropologists and the political scientists and the economists and the biomedical specialists all together to look at the entire process. But of course, that's not what we do. We approach infectious outbreaks as solely a biomedical phenomenon, um, and that is to reduce it to its smallest components and then strike at them with sort of surgical precision. And we do this in a very militaristic way that I kind of call microbial xenophobia. We kind of act like each of these new disease outbreaks is an invasion of this foreign germ that we have to, you know, kill, take out our drones, for example, um, to, to coat Florida with killing chemicals when dengue broke out in 2009. Now, dengue, of course, hadn't been in Florida for 70 years. It was an unprecedented outbreak. Um, and it was immediately attacked as this, you know, assault, assault. And we attacked it with our best sort of killing chemicals. In fact, there wasn't any invasion as such. If you look at where Florida is, it's surrounded by countries where dengue is endemic. It's a permanent part of the landscape. And the mosquitoes that carry dengue have been present in Florida for a long time, too. So there hadn't actually been any invasion as such. What had happened is, in 2008, we had the foreclosure crisis. And that meant a lot of abandoned homes. And because this is Florida we're talking about, that meant a lot of empty swimming pools. And so when the rains came, all these empty swimming pools filled up with standing water. And a year later, lo and behold, we had this unprecedented outbreak of dengue in Florida. Now, would have addressing the housing crisis have helped contain or even prevent the outbreak of dengue in Florida? I have no idea because nobody tried that. What we do know is, arguably, the biomedical approach has failed 
in the sense that dengue is now considered a permanent part of the landscape of Florida. It's endemic disease there. Now, as we've had this, out, uh, this emergence of all these new pathogens, it's been accompanied by a rise in xenophobia. So just as we have microbial xenophobia, we now have a rise in actual xenophobia and scapegoating of marginalized populations. And this was a characteristic of the earliest pandemics in the 19th century and before that, for sure. Um, 19th century cholera is being blamed on the Irish immigrants, and then it was blamed on the Muslims, and then it was blamed on the Eastern Europeans. And today we have Donald Trump blaming Zika on Mexican immigrants, and all the borders closing in Europe for fear of disease carried by Syrian refugees. And not only is this a violation of people's human rights, it also allows pathogens to spread basically unimpeded because then we fail to address the underlying conditions that allow them to do that. So a few years ago, the epidemiologist Larry Brilliant uh, predicted that a pandemic that would sicken a billion people, kill 165 million, and cost the global economy $3 trillion would occur sometime in the next two generations. So that's a pretty scary thought. But at the same time, you know, he didn't have a crystal ball. He's not Nostradamus. This is actually a warning of what will happen if we don't change. And I think there's a lot we can do um, with early detection to begin with. We don't know which microbe is going to emerge to become the next pandemic-causing pathogen. But we do know how it happens, which means we can predict where it's most likely to happen. So this map shows hot spots, places where there's a lot of intensification of agriculture, a lot of slums, a lot of invasion of wildlife habitat, a lot of flight connections, or some combination of all of those things um, where new pathogens are most likely to emerge. So while we can't look for microbes everywhere, we can't do active surveillance of microbes everywhere, we can do it in those hot spots, and that's happening already in an ad hoc way, to see where, where are microbes actually changing and maybe adapting to humans and to, to control them right at the source before they start epidemics. But I think ultimately the goal has to be to prevent outbreaks altogether by reducing the conditions that allow them to occur. So doing things like restoring wild habitats so that the microbes that live in animals stay in animals and don't cross over into people's bodies. We can do things like address, uh, protect the health of the most vulnerable among us, people who live in slums, um, animals in factory farms. But ultimately, I think what this all really leads to is what we need to do is really reimagine our relationship to the microbial world. And there is no us and them anymore. There's no them, the microbes. This is their planet, really. They were here first. Um, and they're kind of a lot better at living on this planet than we are. And I think really what that means is we have to recognize that our health is connected to the health of our societies, certainly, but also the health of our animals, our wildlife, our livestock, and also our ecosystems, generally. So I don't think we can live in a world like McFarland Burnett predicted, where infectious disease is a thing of history. Infectious disease will always be part of our future. I think that's part of the human condition, is we live in a microbial world, and we'll always have infection with us to some extent. But that's a risk we, have to, we can learn to live with, I think. And there's so many ways in which we can reduce the risk of highly disruptive and deadly epidemics and pandemics. And the real trick, I think, will be finding the political will to do that. Thank you so much for listening. Well, that was terrifying. <laughs> Thank you very much. One thing before we even get any further, I noticed in your list of hot spots, you, uh, you seem to have the eastern seaboard of the United States as one of them. Is that because of the flights or? I think it's a combination of flights and livestock. And yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of emergence of new diseases here too, Lyme disease being just one of them. But. You've written that experts predict a major pandemic, as we just showed, within the next couple of generations. I realize that you're not Nostradamus either, but do you have any feel for what it might look like? Um, in, in yeah, I do. Well, we're living through three pandemics right now, right? We have the HIV pandemic that's been going on since the 80s. We have the um, cholera pandemic, the seventh cholera pandemic is going on right now. And now we have a Zika pandemic. I mean, if you define a pandemic as an outbreak of disease that starts in one part of the world and spreads like a wave 
you know, a single wave across global populations and continents. Zika certainly fits that definition. So, so we do know what it looks like because we're, we're living through one, several right now. Do you, but do, but the, the ty I think the pandemic that we see, you know, in the science fiction movies that comes in and takes everybody out, is that going to be an influenza? Is it going to be, uh, you know, vector borne? Is it going to be contagious? Well, most of the experts I talked to, um, there were two that were at the top of their list. And I think the caveat being no one expected Zika virus, right? So, so you know, that was a completely unexpected emergence that, it, you know, who would have thought a mosquito-borne thing that comes, and then it's sexually transmitted completely, you know, off the charts and it causes uh, birth defects. Um, so, prediction, so predictions are not great generally. <laughs> but the two that I heard the most about were certainly um, in novel forms of influenza, um, only because even, you know, the even a slight increase in mortality from an influenza virus would be a huge number of deaths because so many we're, they're so good at spreading among us. Um, and then the second one was antibiotic resistant bacteria, which I think is a you know a huge threat, um, especially to just the practice of medicine. You know, it changed the face of medicine generally, where you know a, a scratch and a, a common injury can become a life threatening problem suddenly if you have those bugs around. And I mean, we saw just last week with the, the announcement of the, the, you know, the the, the microbe resistant to, to all antibiotics. Um, you know, people have a tendency to to freak out, if you will, when they hear stuff. And the and journalists who sometimes do or don't have science backgrounds uh, tend to not quite understand what they're writing about. How do you sort of live that balance, warning people what they should be cognizant of without actually terrifying them to death? Right. <laughs> so you kind of have to like get in between like being terrified and being, um, you know, kind of denying it, right? Because I think, and this is, I, I had a chapter in my book that focused especially just on this, is like, how do we respond to these threats? And I think what I've seen is we either, you know, freak out completely or we deny it. You know, when the dengue broke out in Florida, people had parades in the street dressed up like dengue, dressed up like mosquitoes. There's a band called Dengue Night Fever. I mean, they just were, you know, they're just completely denying that this thing was happening. Um, whereas then we have, you know, one Ebola case and a teacher who goes to a conference in Dallas two blocks from a hospital where that guy was treated is quarantined for two weeks in Maine, which is, you know, just out of control hysteria. And I think the reason is there is a common underlying thing to the response to that, which is that we tend to feel powerless in the face of infection. And I think as a society, we've sort of decided infectious disease is something that the experts have to deal with, the white-coated experts. So we, unless they can give us a drug or vaccine, we feel completely vulnerable. So it's the same way people respond to, say, you know, the threat of death itself. You either, you know, laugh it off or you freak out about it because you, you don't feel empowered to do anything. And I think that's what I was trying to get at in this book is that there's a lot of ways in which we are empowered. You know, not, we don't need to just wait for the drug or wait for the vaccine. There's things we can do as a society and as individuals, too. And yet when we tell people, you know, even, even this year with Zika about, you know, not leaving standing water, that just seems to go straight over people's heads. I mean, the, 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 the concrete thing that the public can do, that the, the, not, the people who are not in white coats can do, seems to sort of not really work. Yeah, and I think, I think that goes back to, let's wait until there's uh, you know, a repellent we can put in that's magically gonna take care of it, or um, you know, you're just kind of veering between like, let's deny this is even happening, la 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 la, or, you know, or I'm gonna freak out and not gonna you know, go, go anywhere where there's mosquitoes stay indoors all, all summer long. So I wrote about the, the factory farm movement in the early 1980s from the animal welfare point of view. Um, is, is there, do you think that now that we know, we understand that factory farming is not just bad for the animals, but bad for the humans, do you think that there might be some way in to actually do something about some of these conditions? Yeah, I think there is. And I think, you know, the, the current administration, the Obama administration has made some moves, I mean, to, to start dealing with that. And internationally, there's more attention being paid, but it's already gone, you know, arguably to a crisis point. So we've already been like terrible, terrible, um, you know, you know, uh, we haven't safeguarded our antibiotics. We could have had, we could have had these drugs around for a lot longer than we can. And I think the, the most, um, you know, the most popular response right now is to kind of throw more money at it to get the drug companies to make more antibiotics because it's another case of market failure where antibiotics, you know, I think it's something like 13 out of the 18 biggest drug companies in the world have dropped antibiotics out of their portfolios altogether. 
because it's just, you know, there's no money in it. Um, and we as consumers, well, we as consumers, <laughs> not all of you experts, um, but, you know, we're not willing to pay more than a few hundred dollars for really what's a life-saving drug, whereas tens of thousands will spend on, you know, a cancer drug that might extend life for a couple weeks or a month, um, which, is, which is on us, too. Um, but, yeah, I think the, the, you know, throwing more money at the market side of it is probably politically easier than actually reducing consumption, although, to me, reducing consumption is going to be the more sustainable solution in the end. So what should sort of the, the, the next level up from the consumers be doing to, to prevent the next pandemic? Government, the WHO, policymakers. I think one of the most um, promising uh, develops that I saw over the course of just writing this book was um, these new efforts to kind of bring different disciplines together. Um, the One Health Movement, for example, where you're bringing veterinarians and wildlife biologists together with um, medical experts to, to look at the whole, the whole infectious disease process. So we're not just waiting until the outbreak occurs, which is arguably already too late, right? Because by the, time, by the time that happens, we, we're seeing exponential growth of this pathogen, and our response at best is linear. So there's going to be a mismatch. Um, we need to walk it back farther, and I think um, movements like One Health is starting to try to do that. So you spent six years on this book. Um, what, what went into this research, and how did you sleep at night without being terrified? <laughs> Um, so I spent probably half the time reporting from, um, you know, places where new diseases are emerging and then uh, about half the time looking at the history of pandemics um, and then a bunch of years write, writing it and rewriting it and rewriting it again. <laughs> so, so, um, so yeah, so that, that's, that was the basic long process. But um, I don't feel frightened, I guess. One thing that gives me that me, lets me sleep at night, I should say, is this balance between, you know, you look at it from the pathogen's point of view. They want to, virulence is in, in their favor, right? Because then they get to replicate more, and that's what really mostly makes you sick. Um, so that works for them, but they also need to transmit. That's the other constraint, right? They have to spread from one person to the other, and if they kill you too fast, you know, they're not going to be able to do that that well. So, you know, that, that, help, that helps me. You know, I think about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're gonna gonna leave that there. Thank you very much. <laughs> we're gonna move on to our final final speaker, who's Laura Sullivan. Laura is a correspondent for the investigative team at NPR News and my former colleague. Her work has earned her three Peabody Awards and two Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Awards. She's reported on the business of disaster response, the epidemic of rape on Native American reservations, solitary confinement in U.S. prisons, and the U.S. bail bond system, among many other issues for Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and other NPR programs. As a student at Northwestern University in 1996, Sullivan worked with two fellow students on a project that ultimately freed four men, including two death row inmates who'd been wrongfully convicted of an 18-year-old murder on the south side of Chicago. Uh, Laura, we look forward to your talk. Hi. So I'm so excited to be here. I love talking about prisons and all sorts of distressing and disturbing things. Uh, people tell me that my beat is depressing. I don't think so. I think it's dramatic. Um, and I think that I'm going to bring some of that uh, to you today. I started covering police and prisons about, about 15 years ago at the Baltimore Sun, about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I switched to, to NPR. And at this point, I feel like I've been in jails or prisons in probably half the states in this country some, for one reason or another. And when I started going into jails and prisons, you know, a lot of wardens and Correctional officers would talk about the crazies, the people that were just a, such a pain for them to deal with, and they didn't quite know what they were going to do. But over the years, now when I go into jails and prisons, it's like the third thing that comes out of wardens and sheriff's mouths. I mean, I could be in there talking about the nutrition of the bread loaf that they're feeding inmates, and the warden will say, but you know, half of the inmates here are mentally ill, so we can't really feed it to them anyway. And it's just, it's, it's, it is something that has colored every aspect of our criminal justice system and the places where we incarcerate people. So when I look at the statistics from the Bureau of Justice Statistics that came out recently, you can see that in state prisons, 45% of the inmates in state prisons are mentally ill. 
if you look at, at um, I'm sorry, 45% of the federal prison inmates are mentally ill. 60%, almost 60% of the inmates in state prisons are mentally ill. And 64% of the jail inmates in our country right now are mentally ill. Today, right now, 64% of the inmates in our jail right now today are mentally ill. That is huge. That is an unbelievably large number of, of people. Imagine you run an institution and 64% of the people have a diagnosed mental illness. So if you put that in real numbers, that's about 700,000 people on any given day are incarcerated in this country in prisons and jails that have a serious mental illness. And what I find so fascinating about that number is that 50 years ago, we shut down all of our mental asylums, all of our state-run mental asylums, and we said, we're never gonna do this again. We're never gonna lock up people against their will and not provide them any medical treatment and any mental health treatment. We're never gonna turn back again. And we sent everybody out into community mental health centers. We said, we're gonna have everybody go out and be treated in the community. And do you know how many people we released from state-run mental asylums? About 700,000 people. So here we are today, and I thought it would be interesting to take a look back first of where we came from. So this was, a, I interviewed an, a photographer named Chris Payne for a story that I did on All Things Considered, and these were photographs that he took of mental, old, mental asylums in the United States where he either snuck in or got permission to go into that are just standing there. They're abandoned. A lot of them are being turned into condos now. And um, because they're on these gorgeous estates, right? They're in these premier areas of New York and, and Maryland. They're, I mean, they're absolutely beautiful. And he took all of these photographs of everything that was left behind. And you can see how sort of grand and beautiful, you know, you bring your suitcases because you're not leaving. So they all just left them behind in the, in the room. You, these were huge estates. The idea was this sort of idea of moral treatment. We're going to go and put these people in these grand estates. They're going to work on these self-sustaining farms, and that's going to help their mental health, and they'll be fine. Um, and that did not work out well, of course. We know now that, for the most part, it was a horror show in these places. So you would go there, and you would never leave. This photograph, for me, is very interesting. It kind of looks like this was the Oregon State um, uh, facility, a facility in Oregon, in Salem, Oregon. It looks like soup cans, right? So this is an abandoned facility in Oregon. These are ashes of the people who died in the facility, and they just left them in a closet in the basement and put up a fence. And so um, these are unclaimed ashes in the 20th century. I mean, look how beautiful these facilities were. Um, However, because nobody was actually getting really any treatment and people would go there for four decades, five decades, and never be able to leave, we decided no more. So we're going to put all these people out into community health centers. Um, that's what we did, and for a while it worked, except that about 10 or 20 years ago, we cut a lot of the funding for the community mental health centers. So now, Half of, the, half of them have closed at this point. Most of our state facilities have closed. There are thousands of people on wait lists across the country to get into one of these facilities. And it's easy to cut funding for these places. I mean, if you've got budget shortfalls and you have a community mental health clinic that's costing you millions, you know, it's not like a giant voting block for you. And, you know, I mean, it, it's, you know, are you really going to notice if you close this place down? Not for a while. You know, it's not an immediate effect. So it's an easy place to cut, and that's what's happened. And I was doing a story on this issue of some of these places closing, and I was talking to a judge named Steve uh, Leifman down in Miami-Dade in Florida, and he was kind of explaining to me this huge problem he was having of so many mentally ill people coming through the criminal justice system. And so I asked him to explain exactly how this worked, and I'll let you listen to some of the, the tape from this interview. What we used to do, which I, I tell people was the definition of insanity because we kept doing the same thing again and, and again and expected a different outcome, they would commit an offense, the police would arrest them, they'd come to court, they'd be acting out, so we would order uh, two or three psychological evaluations at great expense, 
uh, we would determine that they were incompetent to stand trial and we would release them back to the community and kind of held our breath and crossed our fingers and hoped that somehow they'd get better and come back and we could try them, but they would just disappear and get rearrested. How soon would you often see some of the same people come back? Sometimes within minutes. Minutes? Yeah, they'd walk out the door. They were floridly ill. They'd act out because it's next to the courthouse. There's several officers out there, and they'd get rearrested. Minutes. He said one guy was uh, outside for 14 minutes and was right back inside his courtroom again. Um, so he asked the University of South Florida to take a look at what was happening in his courtroom and in this this justice system down in Miami-Dade. And he said, just tell me, like, what am I dealing with here? Who am I dealing with? What's the lay of the land? And the University of South Florida researchers came back and said, we have an answer for you. It's 97 people. He said, what are you talking about? I've got 10,000 people coming through here every year. And they said, no, no, it's 97 people. There are 97 people that are using up the vast bulk of all of your resources in this county. And so Judge Leifman went and he looked. And he looked at these 97 people and he found that they had been arrested in the past year 2,200 times. And they had collectively stayed 27,000 days in the county jail. This was costing taxpayers, just these 97 people, $13 million that year. And, I mean, look, I mean, you could send 97 people to Johns Hopkins for $13 million. I mean, I know it's getting a little pricey these days. I understand that. It's getting a little more. But that's a lot of money for 97 people. And the vast majority of them were paranoid schizophrenics who were not receiving treatment. Right now in our country, the largest mental health facilities is the Los Angeles County Jail, Rikers Island, and the Cook County Jail in Chicago. So for these facilities, all right, what are we talking about? What does it really look like when you get inside them? In 2007, I went to Pelican Bay in California, and I was doing a story in solitary confinement. It's a, everybody talks about it now, but back then, nobody was really talking about this. It was kind of a new thing, and I was really going to go find out what solitary confinement was like. What I did not expect when I walked into this facility was that as much as it was a story about solitary confinement, it was a story about mentally ill people because the vast majority of the people inside Pelican Bay were mentally ill. Um, and I will, let's take a listen to what that sounded like when I got there. He says he's watched a lot of his neighbors lose their grip on reality. When that happens, there's another part of the prison for them, the psychiatric shoe. That's a man's voice, by the way. In the psychiatric shoe, one inmate is standing in the middle of his cell, hollering at no one. Another is banging his head against the cell door. The psychiatric shoe is full, all 128 beds. One out of every 10 inmates in segregation is housed here in the psychiatric unit. There's even a waiting list. Here, many of the inmates are naked. Some are exposing themselves. The extent of the psychological problems here is laid out on a marker board outside the unit. Lieutenant Steve Perez points to the inmates' names. So here we are here with Vic. Level two, indecent exposure. He's got to be in a jumpsuit. Nichols, he's on a razor restriction. This guy here, Flores, staff assaulted through the food port. Look, shoes here. Shoes, they're taking his shoes. Why? What did he do with his shoes? Maybe he was kicking the cell door repeatedly, over and over and over again, and refused to stop. I had a warden once tell me when we were standing outside of a cell, do you know what to do with a man who hasn't eaten for three days, won't put his clothes on, and is banging his head against the door? And I said, no, I, no, I don't have any idea what you do. And he said, yeah, neither do the officers. I pay $8 an hour. What do, I don't, you know, they're, they're as perplexed about this problem as, as society seems to be. Um, when I was in Pelican Bay, it, you can kind of say, okay, all right, so it looks bad. You know, there some folks have some mental illnesses. They're, you know, acting a little bit um, out there. But, you know, the psychiatrist is coming through. The psychologist is going to come through. Some sociologist is going to get them some behavioral therapy in here. We're going to get some group therapy in here. There was nothing 
There was not, nobody was coming. There was, no, there, was not, there was no medication protocol. There were no doctors coming in. That was it. That was it, day in and day out. That was the lives of those inmates, and that is the lives of the officers, and it all is happening behind closed doors. I was one of the first reporters to, to go into Pelican Bay and to actually capture that. It helps when I don't have a camera. Um, people get a little less nervous when you just have a microphone. But, uh, th you know, that's just the reality of, of what's happening. Um, fast forward eight years, last year, 2015. I heard that there was a sheriff in Chicago that was sort of new to this, Sheriff Tom Dart, and that he wanted to try to do this differently. Chicago Cook County Jail is the largest jail facility in the country, and he had a huge problem. He said when he, he didn't realize he was going to become the mental health provider of Cook County. So he came in and he said, I'm going to see if I can do this different. I'm going to see if I can provide some actual treatment, if I can, you know, figure out a way around this problem. And so he, uh, so I, I went to come take a tour of his facility and um, he was explaining, you know, look, in Chicago, and this is true, they shut down three of the six mental health clinics in the past three years and they also shut down three state hospitals. So if you've got thousands of people who no longer have access to their medication and they no longer have access to any sort of treatment or mental health therapy or, or you know, help of any kind, and they're turned away whenever they try to go get help at one of the actual facilities, they end up in the only place that cannot turn them away, and that's jail. So every morning, all the hundreds of inmates that are picked up in Chicago get funneled into the bullpens down at the Cook County Jail, and they stuff them all, like 50 men, there's some women too, into each of the bullpens. And then they start sorting through them for mental health issues. And this woman, Ellie Montgomery, is um, one of the persons who was supposed to handle, you know, 300 people a day. Just, are you mentally ill or not? What, how are we going to figure this out? Because we've got to figure out where to place you. And this is, this is what it sounds like in the bullpen. Sheriff Tom Dart runs the place. I can't conceive of anything more ridiculously stupid by government than to do what we're doing right now. You can see the problem every morning in the intake center, where 250 new inmates arrested overnight are stuffed into bullpens. Give me 50, number 50, where you at? I'm going to be worried about everyone on the ground right here, because the majority of them are going to have psych histories. Ellie Montgomery is standing in front of the cages. She's the deputy director of mental health policy for the sheriff's office. She and her staff screen all the inmates. Forget the hostile, angry men at the front bickering with jail staff. It's the men in the corners that interest her. Men who come to jail and fall asleep. You know, I'm kind of curious about this guy in the blue. Now, is he dazed because he's on drugs? Or is he dazed because the voices in his head are louder than what's happening around him? One inmate after another. One man tells her he's going to kill himself because he thinks he's already dead. Another guy explains that the voices tell him to hurt people. To walk in and feel like every other person I'm interviewing be mentally ill on any given day to me is, I can't wrap my brain around it. It is staggering what we're really dealing with. And so this is a place that's trying to deal with it, right? So they're going to try to turn their jail into some kind of a treatment place. But no matter what they do, they're running up against the same brick wall that other places run up against, which is what do you do in a jail with someone who is floridly mentally ill? And they didn't know what to do with that question either. This is a place that's trying to do it different, it's trying to do it right. And so they also had a place inside the jail, which they called the psych ward, just like the old days. And they, um, it was, you know, they had not allowed the, the media or the public to go into this facility before, um, and I think probably for good reason, but uh, they said that I could go in with my microphone, as long as I didn't take pictures, which is why we don't have any pictures to show. I don't have any pictures, there you guys. Um, but we can hear it, because what you have to picture is like, so you walk down, this is inside the jail, in like the dark middle of it, there's no natural light, you walk down this really long hallway, just like the old pictures, and you come across into this huge metal door, which they sort of push open, 
And inside, the first one we went into was the women's psych ward. And right off the bat, you just know something is not, it's not right, something's not right here. Um, there, like one woman was, just, there's like several dozen women sitting around in the lobby and one woman is like pulling each individual hair out of her head and like dropping it onto the floor. People are talking to themselves or to somebody else that's not there. And uh, some people are just so drugged out, they ju it's, they're just, like they're just not, no, they're not there. And off to the side of these women who were sitting in sort of the main area, is this room that is completely padded and there's nothing else in it. And so I asked if I could go into the padded room and, and find out what was happening there. So this is what this sounded like. It's a very basic room, just four walls. The walls are padded. The jail's chief psychologist, Kenya Key, steps inside a small dark room behind the community area. It has a drain and a light, nothing else. It's never used as punishment. The purpose of it is to decrease stimulation. There's nothing to write with in this room, but the walls are covered in writing. Slurs written with blood from fingertips or scratched into the walls with fingernails. It's hard to imagine spending time in here. The things that people have scratched into the walls is what's yes. the most disturbing. And the fact that they're all mostly scratched into the door as if they're trying to get out. It, it is, and, and again, it's a little overwhelming. And, and again, it certainly the majority of the patients that are put here are in a state of very high agitation and escalation. It is uh, a forced intervention to help the patient de-escalate. In the men's psych ward down the hall, the scene is similar. Some men are locked into rooms where they pace back and forth for hours in smocks. One man's wearing just a blanket. One was tied down in an empty room during the night with leather straps. They're just now taking them off. What are the leather restraints? Um, full leather restraints are used when um, a patient does not respond to any other intervention, which means they are literally restrained to the bed. So here we are back. Leather restraints, padded rooms, you know, right back where we were 50 years ago. And um, Except 50 years ago, you were put in the padded room with the leather restraints and you were left there for like decades. And now you're put into the leather restraints and into the padded rooms for your 10 day jail sentence for your minor crime where you acted out in front of a restaurant or something like that and you got picked up by police. And then you are that morning propped up, the restraints are taken out, you're propped up, you're walked out to the front door and you're released back into the public without any sort of treatment happening in that process at all. Um, the inmates uh, say that they go to the jail to get medication, Then, and uh, I'm gonna, just for time, skip forward a little bit, but um, for, I'm gonna sort of, we're gonna, there's two more pieces of tape I'm just gonna play really quickly, but uh, these are three inmates that I met when you come out of the psych ward and you kinda can bathe and take care of yourself, you go into division two, and these are a couple of the inmates that I met there and they can explain this medication issue. They're standing by the television while 40 or so others mill about a row of bunks. Jail inmates Joe Edwards, Joseph Jurigi, and Augustus, whose last name we can't use because his case is pending, used to go to a local mental health clinic for counseling and medication before it closed. What I had to do was basically come to county, get my meds, and sometimes, you know, I would even commit a crime just to make sure I got my meds. When you say come to county, you mean to county jail? Yeah, so yeah to the county jail. So a lot of us feel that way because our meds are so hard to get. We can't just go say, hey, I need trazodone, I need Valium, I need Clonopin. Wait a minute, we can't give you that. What do you mean? I've been on it for 30 years. Well, what program were you at? Well, now it's closed. Here... It's more of a little understanding because they know us. Yeah, that's the reality of it. Because right. if you're a frequent flyer and they know you, your medications are given to you right then and there. Here's the problem with that, though. Jail is a very expensive place to get medication. Jail costs $200 a night. So if you've got all these people in there for largely petty offenses for $200 a night, 
you're also clogging up the whole court system. Because everybody, if you get picked up acting out in front of a restaurant and they call the police, that's the police officer's time, and they gotta write the reports, and then you gotta go you know, down to the courthouse, and then some prosecutor has to look at your case, and you have to stand before a judge, and they have to figure out what's gonna happen to you, and then you gotta do your eight days in jail, right? So this is a very expensive, time-consuming process for everybody involved. And if you look at the stats for Chicago, for the Cook County area over the past few years, sure enough, you can see the length of time that people spend in jail awaiting this whole process to unfold has gone up by eight days. So everybody, not just people who are mentally ill or minor offenders, everybody's staying eight days longer in the jail because the whole system is all backlogged. And that eight days is costing taxpayers 10 extra million dollars a year to house them all in jail for eight extra days. So the question is, do you want to spend the $10 million on education, or do you want to spend it on the inmates who are hanging out in jail because they're just waiting to get in front of the judge? Or I don't know, maybe we want to spend the $10 million on a community health clinic who could help the people from to get their meds and to get the help they need so that they don't act out in front of the restaurant and then that whole process doesn't happen all the way down the road. So just to sum up this whole thing, this is the last thing that Tom, Sheriff Tom Dart told me as we were walking through one of the divisions. Um, he seemed to kind of put what I think was a pretty good perspective on the whole issue. This is our last piece of tape. You have the population clearly identified as mentally ill and you're releasing them to the street with nothing. This isn't left or right, conservative, liberal talking. What do you think is going to happen? While he's talking, a man in the back of the room starts walking in circles. Report this then. Tell everybody disappear. And that's it. Shut it down five minutes. He's saying he's God, says he's going to make everyone disappear. Now the other mentally ill inmates around him are getting agitated. I'm God. I'm Jesus Christ. I'm Jesus. You see me? I'm Puerto Rican. You see I'm Puerto Rican. You see I'm Jesus. Three officers with mental health training slowly surround him. They don't say anything. They just nod their heads, agreeing with him. On cue, the officers start walking, and the inmate instinctively starts walking with them. He doesn't know it, but he's headed back to the psych ward. Sheriff Dart barely pauses. He sees it every day. Dart says he understands money for community health centers is tight, but he says doing it this way is costing more. Clearly, our society had determined that the state-run mental health hospitals of the 40s and 50s were abhorrent, that, my God, our society cannot tolerate this. We're much more advanced than that. And then I just find it, the irony just so thick that that same society now finds it okay to put the same people in jails and prisons. But then he shakes his head and changes his mind. I know people care. I don't think they know. So in the words of... Tom Dart, as we look at what's next for public health in the United States. Now you all know. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I want to put this in some perspective. Um, what Yamish talked about is a problem that dates back arguably to the beginning of the United States. What Sonia talked about is a problem that arguably dates to the beginning of the planet. What you're talking about is a problem that dates to the last 30 or 40 years. Absolutely. I mean, how is it that we've let it come to this without, as you say, people knowing? Well, I think that for a long time we didn't want to know. I mean, we just put everybody in insane asylums and they were really far away and they were out in the middle of these areas and they were self-sufficient so they weren't interacting with our communities and that was just where everybody went. And then we thought, okay, everybody's going to come back to the community and we'll provide them treatment, but we just didn't do it. I mean, we haven't provided mental health treatment in our communities. And so, and then when we did, we just took it all away after we did it. And it was kind of a slow, slippery slide to this place where we're at now, where people literally cannot get treatment, even if they want it. Even if they're voluntarily saying, I need some help, can I please get some help? Like those inmates, the last three inmates, I mean, they wanted help. They wanted their community mental health centers to be open. They had been going there for years and they didn't have any other place to get their medication at this point. So is there a way to transfer those services 
to the jails or to the prisons? I mean, as you point out, most of these people are petty offenders, but I assume that some of them aren't. This is the debate that keeps going on about people who keep shooting people. It's like, well, it's not the gun, it's that they're mentally ill. I mean, those people you some probably of them, don't yeah. want on the street. So there, it's an interesting, about half of the mass shootings that we've had, we've seen people who had sort of a, a floored mental illness happening. In other cases, there, I mean, I think you could probably make an argument that there they're all mentally ill if you're shooting other people, but um, that less of like a psychosis or like a paranoid schizophrenia and maybe more, of, you know, some sort of anger issues happening um, where it's sort of a premeditated thing. I mean, the Gabby Giffords thing, I think it's become out that he's was sort of, that he was schizophrenic at this point and then some of the other folks. And then some of them are dead, so we really don't know. We can't really ask them after the fact if they were hearing voices or if they just were, um, angry over something. But, um, you know, I, it's, it's hard for people who work in these jails. I mean, even in, some, in that tape where you were listening to in, in Cook County, you hear them call inmates patients. And they do this in the same sentence. In the same sentence, you'll hear a correctional officer call, an, you know, an, someone an inmate and then call them a patient. I mean, they're as confused about all this as we are. They, the correctional officers don't necessarily know what to do. Are they a nurse in a psych ward? Or are they a correctional officer in a jail or prison? I mean, those are two very different jobs. And are we gonna start training our correctional officers to be nurses in psych wards? Is that what we expect of them? And if we are gonna do all that work, then the question is, is the jail really the best place to be putting people who have mental illness in the first place? I mean, maybe we could train those people to do that work in an actual facility that can help them. Um, it's expensive. I mean, jail, jail is a really expensive place to put somebody overnight. And if you're gonna you know, treat them, I mean, it costs a fraction of that to run a community mental health clinic. But again, you know, it's, an, it's a super easy thing to cut when it comes time for the budgets because this is not, they don't have a lobby. This is not something that, you know, is gonna be pushing politicians for this thing. And it, it takes a while for the public to really notice the effects of the closures of the mental health centers until now when all of a sudden our jails are costing a fortune. Overlay this with what happens when these men and women get beyond the jail and off into prisons, and now we have the rise of the, of the private correctional facility, if you will. Is, yeah. that, is, it, is there a difference? I mean, I would, the private correctional facilities clearly want to turn a profit. And, right, um, this, this raises a whole, a whole number of new questions. If, if, we're, if, we're, if we're putting people who, are, who have a severe mental illness into a correctional facility, and that correctional facility is operating with a motive for profit, how do we ensure that they are getting the best treatment and care that they need when the profit structure of that facility is not going to be necessarily aligned with those interests? And that's, I mean, there's been a number of lawsuits um, against some of the private correctional facilities over this very issue, over not only mental health care, but just medical care in general. Um, it's a real problem. It's a problem. I would also assume that the, the prison uh, or jail uh, environment is not conducive to treating mental illness. No, in fact, most studies say that you get a lot worse. You know, that, that if, you, if you spend, in most jails and prisons th that are not like Cook County, which is, you know, sort of trying to do something about this, most are just, you know, just suffering through it on a day-to-day -day basis, they don't have any treatment center. They don't even have a psych ward. I mean, we can say, what are we doing with padded brooms and leather restraints and forced medication again? I thought we put this all behind us. Other facilities, they don't even have that. And so if somebody's acting out and you've got a, a problem inmate who won't do any of these things, you get sent to solitary confinement. So if you take someone who's floridly mentally ill, hearing voices, paranoid and delusional, and you throw them in a box, you know, for the next 92 days in dark, I mean, how is that? I mean, and we th and and then you know the rub about all of this, and I think this is one of the biggest takeaways of the whole thing is that 97% of these people are coming back to our communities. I mean, 90% 97% of inmates will be released, whether they spend seven days in the Cook County Jail or 17 years in solitary confinement on, in Pelican Bay. They are all returning, 
and they're not receiving any mental health treatment while they're in prison or jail. And most of them are worse off because of the experience of having been there. Beyond money, obviously money is a big part of this, are there barriers that prevent the provision of mental health treatment in incarcerated people? Not really. I mean, there are, you have restrictions on forced medication. That These are laws that have come out since the 1950s and 60s. So you can't just say this inmate's a problem, let's just you know, dope them up with something. You cannot do that. Um, <clears throat> but under the care of a psychiatrist, you can. There are some avenues where you can do that. Like the Cook County Jail will forcibly medicate someone if they are um, at, in such a, a state that it's becoming, they're becoming a danger to themselves or other inmates, which apparently happens a lot. So, but then there are limits to sort of how that works and how long that can happen. So you're starting to, to see, as you saw at Cook County, at least some effort to deal with this problem. Right. Is there anything going on at the state or federal policy level, or is this just gonna sort of con continue until? Yeah, I mean, the simple answer to that question is no. There's not. I mean, it's really, it's at the point where their jails and prisons are just making do with this. And um, there's no major action happening in the country to deal with this issue at all. Despite all that, I mean, there's a huge debate going on in Capitol Hill about mental illness and treating mental illness, although I think it's more yes. linked to also yeah. treating opioid abuse as it is to, right. to mental illness. And that debate is often about assisted outpatient treatment, you know, whether or not it can be forced or not forced is what it's coming down to. It's actually a project that I'm starting right now, so. <laughs> Yeah, that'll, we'll, we'll come back and do it again in a year. We'll talk not, about that not, one, but yeah. Not to end on yeah. too depressing, you know, is there, is there any hope for, for fixing this problem? I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated to see what Sheriff Dart can pull out of his pocket on this. I mean, maybe he can figure out a way. He gets visits all the time from all kinds of other facilities who want to know how he managed to do this in this decrepit, old, underfunded facility. Um, and it's interesting that Cook, in Cook County, the, for the first time ever in the United States, the head of the jail is a psychologist. That has never happened in the history of the United States. And she's, I think she, unless she's, she's not a psychologist, she's a psychologist, yeah. So that, I mean, she has, her pathway has been psychology and she's now the head of the Cook County Jail. I mean. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we would have thought that was the craziest thing we'd ever heard. You go to criminal justice classes, you, go, you study criminology if you want to be the head of a jail. You don't study psychology. And she is now the first and, and only uh, psychologist running the nation's largest jail. Well, we see if they, they can yeah, uh, see what make they can some do. kind of impact. Thank you very much. Also thank our other speakers, Himich and Sonia, for amazing talks today. Um, you've given us a lot to think about. And Dean Clagg, I'd like to invite you to come back for your concluding remarks. I'd like to echo my thanks as well. You know, we, we expected a, a good symposium, but we got a great symposium. And uh, the things you told us really pushed us, you know, and when you were describing the man beating his head against the door in the jail, I felt like doing that here with a description of, of what's happening in our jails. You know, the, the issues, you know, you uh, meet about social justice, pandemics, I, that's the piece I knew the most about. And, uh, but you have to worry after you hear what you've said, are we a rational species? I mean, we, we appear not to be able to make uh, rational judgments and because we, we understand problems, but, but because the budget is more politically expedient to spend it on uh, drones for mosquitoes or jails rather than treatment centers. We end up with these crazy situations. I have to say that public health, we like big problems. We like big complex problems. And so, so although it wasn't pleasant, I think it was inspiring. I think all of us who are here and there's hundreds and hundreds of people who are watching on the web uh, come away with a sort of an, a, a dedication and a sense that we have to we have to work even harder that no matter the successes we've had over the last hundred years there are still big big problems problems may be different I mean the, the challenges of course is that the problems of yesteryear uh, the pandemics the infectious diseases they haven't gone away 
But now we recognize that there are problems that are even more complex, problems of, of policy and, and human behavior and, and how we organize, organ, organize health systems. So uh, for me, it was a, just an incredible, uh, incredible afternoon. And I, I can't think of a better way to sort of cap off this internal year of, of thinking about public health and about celebration. So, so again, I, I want to thank you uh, for being here today and sort of bringing your best game. And uh, thanks for the work that you do. So. I have to give a shout out to our team in external affairs who, who organized today, and especially Brian Simpson, who's here, who put himself in the best spot to tweet and get the best pictures. Uh, and so th Brian, uh, who, who edits our magazine and is uh, sort of our, our head writer, uh, uh, th thanks for, for coming up with this. Julie, uh, you did a masterful job. And it, it's, it's so wonderful to, to put a, a, a face to a voice for both you and, and Laura. And uh, so and you did not disappoint. I started out by saying that we were proud of our heritage. Uh, and, uh, but we know that the challenge is the future. But I did want to point out one thing. This is a, a new book that's going to be uh, published tomorrow by the Johns Hopkins Press. It's called Health and Humanity. As part of the centennial, we felt that it was our, uh, our responsibility to talk about the history of the school. We have a great history that was written by Elizabeth Fee that goes to 1939. This book was written by Karen uh, Cruz Thomas, uh, who's here in the room, I think. Karen, and, uh, and so it's a lot of work. Many years, when you were talking about six years of effort, we knew exactly what you meant to produce your book. Uh, and so this will be uh, uh, on Amazon tomorrow. Uh, and, uh, and so Karen, thanks for this. So uh, I want to uh, thank everybody for coming, and thank you again for uh, an incredible afternoon. Thank you.